welcome to uh, Biblical History, and I'm Art McCary, your host. And we're entering into a whole new division of the Bible called the uh, Epistles of the Apostles, or the Acts of the Apostles. The question, which apostles? <laughs> the word apostle merely in the Greek means one cent. Somebody, it was the message from Garcia. <laughs> it's, he sent the message, all right, through these people. The question, who were the originals? Who were the original apostles? And Paul was starting to have a problem, especially when he went around, he had enemies uh, with the Jews, as well as he had enemies with the Gentiles. So he was being attacked from all places. And even worse, they were infiltrating the true church. <laughs> this is like saying, oh, we're all together. We're really not apart. We just see it differently than you do. And you say, well, I'll, I'll hear you out. I'll listen to you. So when we go to, into this third division of the New Testament, before we get into Revelation, they were in a battle. Jesus told us in Matthew 24, the first thing that would happen to the church, the first thing is false apostles false prophets, and they'll deceive many in the church, in the church of God, because it was a very democratic organization. All a church means is a called out group. <laughs> it just means you were invited to a conference <laughs> to discuss it. <laughs> and boy, did they have them. They really had them. So let's pick up the account in 2 Corinthians 10 where Paul talks about it. In verse 12, let's see what he has to say about the real original apostles. He said in verse 12, For we, speaking about the apostles, dare not make ourselves of the number of the group or compare ourselves with some that compare themselves, but they measured themselves by themselves. In other words, they were deciding their priests or ministers or prophets or bishops or whatever. They decided it. It wasn't that God sent them. This was of their own human mind. Like I've asked people once in a while, not that this is wrong because it might be true, but it also might be false. <laughs> I've asked some people, I'd say, well, how did you come to the ministry? And he said, I just felt I should. Dilly, dilly, ding, 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 as we used to say. <laughs> Ain't that nice? Or isn't that something? Now, it could be true. God might be calling you. But you see, you've got to be sure you're speaking every word of God and not your ideas. We're going to do a segment down the road where you are warned by Peter not to do any personal interpreting of the Bible. Never interpret the Bible of what you think it says. And I told you before, many times, it took me 40 years to try to control myself to stop guessing. <laughs> if I don't find it say specifically, when I come to an understanding something, I just believe I don't know. And I say I don't know. And there's a lot in this book I don't know. And I hope you feel the same. Because Paul said, look, we aren't to run around just trying to say we're right. 
but they measuring themselves by themselves. You ever hear the Nobel Prize? <laughs> That's what it is. It's enough of the celebrities in the field that the discipline is that they agree with him as the ones to listen to. But how about all the others that don't agree? <laughs> how about them? How about listening to them and comparing themselves among themselves? Listen to this. I, I didn't underline it. I'm going to underline it in my Bible here. Are not wise. If you interpret the Bible by your human understanding, you're not a wise person. If you insist that you're right, you're not a wise person. That's one thing the Greeks didn't do. They never thought they were right. They listened to everybody. <laughs> That's why they were the wise in the Bible. So going on then, he says, verse 13. But we will not boast of things without our measure. In other words, we're not going to use our system of math. We're not going to determine by one and one is two out of our own head. We're going to have to be told out of the word of God, it's what he said. We don't measure God. Do you measure God? Ask yourself, who tells you who God is? The knowledge he gives you, how he teaches you, what you're to learn, what you're to be like, which is like him, which you don't know anyway. And I don't either. <laughs> what a mess, huh? What a mess. So he goes along and he tells us in verse, first, first, uh, verses 13, but according to the measure of the rule, and my little even side one says limit. There's limits. We can't just be guessing. Which God has distributed to us a measure to reach even unto you for you to get and understand. It'll make sense to you. It'll be logical. For we stretch not ourselves beyond who we are. We know we're humans. As though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. We're just telling you about Jesus, what he said. We heard him. We listened to him. We got him in visions. I, I had a lot of visions with Jesus going on. Then he went and he says, not boasting of things without our measure. That is, of other men's labors. We don't get involved with what other men claim to be. But having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel, the good news, in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. You know, I belonged to a denomination for 25 years, and I was one of the top preachers. And when I left, I never again bothered anybody by the work of that man. They were not to do it. So at this time, I want you to think about it. We'll be right back soon. We're ready to see that the only thing we should glory in or think is good or right is in God. Not in any man, not what he thinks is right, not what any of us thinks is right. But it tells us in Second Corinthians 10 and verse 17, but he that glorieth, let him glory in Christ what he taught, what he did, the miracles he performed, the acts that he did, what he said. But not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord approves. It's God who's got to tell you is the right one. Now, how does he do that? 
Well, let's go on and find out in 2 Corinthians 11. He divides these two groups of apostles. True apostles, false apostles. Christ says he's good. There's the first thing going to happen is false prophets. They're going to say the wrong things. So going on in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, he said, Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly. Now, why does he call it folly? Because he brags about himself. <laughs> he brags about himself. Listen, here's what he said. And indeed, be patient with me, he's telling them. For I am jealous over you. By jealousy, mean I have a lot of zeal. He doesn't mean jealous in a bad sense. He means it in a good sense. He says, I care about you immensely. That's what he's really saying that he's jealous about. With godly jealousy. See, God's jealous for us, not because it's him, but because he wants our welfare. Paul wants our welfare, the good for us. For I have exposed you to one husband. Who's the husband? Christ. He's the groom, isn't he? And we're supposed to be the bride. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't that how plain it is? That I may present you as a chaste virgin. In other words, not a whore, not a prostitute, a virgin to Christ. To be the bride of Christ, you cannot be filled with sin. In fact, you have to have the kind of heart that you're willing to die for him as he died for you. God the Father will never allow his son to marry a woman who wouldn't die for him like he died for her. He wouldn't permit it. Makes no sense. Then he goes on. For I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve, you know, I think about Eve, and I feel sorry for her because she started the problem. <laughs> She's the one, the first, to, to eat, <clears throat> to want to be on her own. She wanted to decide good and evil by herself, and then little old Adam followed her because he loved her. They got a lot of movies today where they show where people kill somebody they love or uh, they talk the other mate into helping them kill somebody they hate. That mate is silly. <laughs> For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, now here's the point, whom we have not preached, or if we receive another spirit which you have not received, or another good news gospel of God's kingdom which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. You got to watch out. Watch out for this person. For I suppose, now here's where he gets a little folly because he starts complimenting himself. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. He's comparing himself to the other 11, 11 original apostles. He says, but though I be rude in speech, I'm going to be very forward about it, yet not in knowledge. What I'm, not going, to, what I'm going to tell you now, don't remember it, <laughs> because it's not real. But it's the truth. But we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. He says, look, you know me. You know about my whole background. I've been very transparent. He's not hiding anything. For I have committed an offense in abasing myself. I, mean, I might have made a mistake by saying so little about my background. Not giving you my background. In other words, he was saying, I'm going to give you my profile of my life. That you might be exalted. Not for my bragging, not because I think I'm something, but for you, because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. He never took a penny. Do you hear it? I want you to hear it. Just like Jesus never asked for money, neither did Paul. He worked. He worked. Boy, when I see that, it upsets me. 
because I learned that lesson too. <laughs> he says, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. Other churches gave me donations because they thought so I wasn't having enough to eat or a place to sleep. They gave me a place to sleep and gave me money uh, so I could eat. I didn't come to you Corinthians. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. Ah, here are the Greeks again. The northern Greeks helped them out, the Corinthians, down further south. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. He worked. He worked. In 2 Thessalonians 3, he said all the apostles worked. Now, when they needed help, people could help, just like you're supposed to help anybody who's in need, not because they were just ministering. Then he goes on in verse 11. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knows I love you. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we, that they turn around. I'm even for the people speaking against us. I even want to help the people who are my enemies. That's the love he had. For such are what? False apostles. Here we go. False apostles. Deceitful. They're not transparent. Workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They were going around saying they were the real apostles. They were the originals. They were conning. That's what they were doing. Ah, oh, how clear. And no marvel for Satan himself is transferred into an angel of light. A light bringer brings the truth. A light bringer makes it open. He's transparent. He's on it. He says everything about it. He doesn't hold anything back. Where you know where you stand with this person. And he lives up to that as well. He is what he speaks. That's what he is. There is no great thing of his ministers being transformed as the ministers of righteousness who end shall be according to their works. So he said again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, then I may boast myself a little. I'm going to set you straight. So now we understand this tra transmission, this coming to the Corinthians. Welcome. And we're ready to go with the final section. And we're going to cover completely the Acts of the Apostles where... Uh, they start to write the epistles. Remember, we're starting in this new, th uh, uh, just before the last group, which is Revelation, we're doing the third part or division of the New Testament. And these are the Acts of the Apostles. And we found out and learned in summarizing so far that the first thing they were confronted with was false apostles, as well as the original true apostles. Well, here now in 2 Corinthians 13, the last of the book of Corinthians that he wrote to the Greeks, it was the third time he came to them. So let's pick up the story to see that very simply, salvation is a personal matter. Salvation isn't determined by a church. Salvation isn't determined by one minister. Salvation isn't de determined by one teacher or philosopher or whatever, like the Greeks used to do. So let's read in 2 Corinthians 13, verse thir uh, 1. He said, this is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth, and he's quoting now Old Testament scripture. 
In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. You know, it's a funny thing how easy it is. Somebody tells you, do you know what so-and-so is doing? And you say, no, what's he doing? And they tell you. And you say, no, yeah, yeah, they say. And you know, too many of us believe it. Let's say what they said was true, but it's only part of the story. And if you heard the whole story, you'd understand why they did it, and it wasn't for the reason you thought. You know what Paul is telling these Christians at Corinth, these Greeks? He's saying, don't be so ready to believe everything you hear. He said, you better get two or three witnesses before every word is starting to be believed. You better get at least three different sources, three different times, three different ways. He said, I told you before, and I foretell you, as if I were present, he's writing this epistle. This is the beginning of of the fourth division of the New Testament, where he's, I mean, third division of the New Testament, where he's telling us that what he needs to do is you better check up on your own. He said, even though I'm not there. And he warned them, and he says, I write to them which therefore have sinned, and to all others that if I come again, I'll not spare them. In other words, I'm going to tell what they're doing wrong. Do you know what they used to do if an elder or a minister committed sins in their life while they're ministering? You know what they had to do? They used to have to stand up before the whole congregation. I'm not talking about the minister. I'm talking about the other elders and heads in the church that were guiding it, and they had to name this person and tell what the sin was. And there had to be at least three witnesses. One didn't work. Remember Paul said, after the first and second admonition, the third time have no company. So here's what he's telling these people at Corinth. He said he's not going to spare them. He's going to make it public. Since you seek a proof of Christ, speaking in me, whether or not I'm a real apostle, which to you, uh, word, is not weak, but is mighty in you. In other words, I'm the one who's been teaching you. I'm the one who's been preaching the truth. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lived by the power of God. He, Jesus, was tested in every way like as we. Every single human temptation that a human being has during his earthly life, he experienced. That made him a good judge, didn't it? Because he knew just how you felt. He knew what you went through. He considered that part of it, as well as what your sin was. He considers, he's a, he's a guy we need on the Supreme Court. <laughs> we could use him. <laughs> so going on, he says in verse 4, he tells us, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lived by the power of God. What? Through the Holy Spirit. Here we go with the Holy Spirit again. All throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit is involved all throughout for we also are weak in him we in our human body uh, we apostles are weak but we shall live with him by the power of god toward you it's god's holy spirit in us that tells the difference now he tells us something i i'd circle this if you if i if you were following me with your bible and if you're going through this and this is your study Bible, circle the words, examine yourselves. 
You know what that means? You're going to judge yourself. Not others. You're going to do the judging. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Oh boy, how many times I've said it. When people stand up in the judgment, he's not going to ask them what church they belong to. He's going to tell them what sins they did and why didn't they listen to God. You're on your own before God and Christ. That's what a good judge does, doesn't he? He looks for the guilty. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you? Now, if Christ is in you, then it means you live a life like Jesus. And everything that he did, what he said, what he taught, how he behaved, all of that you want to be exactly like. That's what you do. But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. We're not the ones that are causing you the trouble. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, that's what the issue is, don't harm anybody. Not that we should appear approved like we're something, but that you should do that which is honest, be honorable, be above the board, be admit when you're weak or you, you can't do it. Seek help, look for it, though we be reprobates, even if we're wrong. For we are doing nothing against the truth, but the truth. And we look forward to you being with us again. God be with you.